الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد We pick back up in the series that we have of the 100 and the 100 is not necessarily يعني, the people that are the most famous but there are people that you really should know from the history of Islam and as I was choosing who we should be studying I mean for example the Prophet والسلام, we studied the seerah already in detail over three years Alhamdulillah so that's obviously the most important then Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali radiallahu anhum, Hassan, Hussein radiallahu anhum, we discussed them in depth during the seerah Dhuru. When we got to the Khilafah Abu Bakr, we covered him, and Umar, Uthman, Ali, Hassan, Hussein after them, because the discussion of the Khilafah, we discussed them in detail. Some of the people that we discussed, like Khatija radiallahu anha, in the seerah, but not to the depth as we should have, because it wasn't about them, it was about the life of the Prophet But she was so, such an important person in the history of Islam that we studied her by herself. And Sumayya radiallahu anha and others. The next, subhanallah, again, is, is a woman. And I'm not teaching about a woman because this is some kind of like affirmative action or, you know, woke you know, progressiveness. No, it is because of the service she did for Islam was such that she deserves it. Not because she's a woman, but because of her service as it is. So if you took all the men and women and you didn't care about gender and didn't care about any of that, you just looked at their service for Islam, that is how I want to choose who we need to study. Before I begin, no doubt in one dars, it is impossible to even scratch the service, surface of what she did for Islam. So this will be multiple durus on her. And I chose this as, a, as also a way to unite the Muslim Ummah. One of the things that we find a lot today is division in the Muslim Ummah. And that division sometimes is political, sometimes it's, you know, people have their own interests and so on. But if we go back to the Quran, and when we go back to the Sunnah, and we go back to the example of the Salaf al-Ummah and we get to know those Sahaba and Ulema who sacrifice for this religion and their status, then inshallah this will be a unity for us to go back to their way. Today, everybody wants to unite upon their own way. <laughs> if you tell every, every Muslim, when I, I travel the world, right? I go to different now, Indonesia, Malaysia, I was all over, right? And you meet Muslims from different walks of life and everybody says we need to be united. So like, you know, it's kind of like a rhetoric right now. We need to be united. Okay, how should we unite? Well, follow me. <laughs> That's the solution. Follow me. <laughs> if everybody wants to be followed, how are we going to unite? Right? So the only practical way is we go back. We don't say my culture and yours, my madhab and yours, my people and yours, my group and yours, my movement and yours. No, let's go back to qala Allah. Let's go back to Qala Rasul alayhi salatu salam. Ma huwa sah, yani what is authentic on al Mustafa alayhi salatu salam? And what is the best practical example is from the Sahaba radiyan. These Sahaba were chosen by Allah. They were not on accident, they were chosen by Allah. And Allah in the Quran has said He is pleased with them. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam in the hadith that is muttafaqun alayhi, yani it is reported from al-Bukhari and al-Muslim in both those books. Through many chains, not just through a single chain, through many chains, through many different Sahaba, and that's very important to understand. This hadith is not just reported once. You know, we talk about Sahih ahadith, then we talk about tawatur. We talk about that which is reported through many chains and through independent chains, through different Sahaba. So it shows that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned this multiple times. Because some of those Sahaba like Abu Hurairah who is one of the narrators, he became Muslim later. 
Abu Sayyid al Khudri is another narrator there. Right? So it shows an emphasis on what is said where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he forbid us from cursing his Sahaba. From cursing or speaking ill about the Sahaba. And then he says, Walladi nafsi bi And Rasulullah sallam takes qasam. He is taking an oath by Allah. Law an ahadakum anfaqa mithla uhudin dahaba. Even if one of you gives in sadaqah, you give the size of uhud of gold in sadaqah. Now, one of the one of the benefits of going to Mecca and Medina and, and the areas where Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was is when you see the different places, these ahadith give you context. Meaning, before I went to Medina, when I've never been to Medina, I heard these ahadith, and okay, Uhud. But when I went to Medina and I saw Uhud is huge, it's not just one peak, it's like a whole site. And, and, and you know, it covers one whole side of Medina, even nowadays when you drive, you'll see the lights and things, it's huge. Right? So now understanding, imagine if that whole mountain was made of gold, and you gave it in sadaqah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa say, Ma adraka. You will not reach mud ahadihim. You will not even reach one handful of what the Sahaba gave. Oh, nafsiha, nasifiha, or, or even half of it. What does it say? That if they gave one little handful, because of their sacrifice and their, what they did for the ummah, the, the level they reached, the people later on cannot even giving a mountain of gold. Now, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he forbid us from cursing the Sahaba. Right? But this is also mentioned repeatedly by the Sahaba themselves. And I'm not going to depend on any weak ahadith. Inshallah, throughout these series, I'm not depending on da'if ahadith. These are all that which is hasan and sahih, maqbola. Ibn Majah mentioned in his sunan, a hasan riwayah, a reliable riwayah, from Abdullah ibn Umar and ibn Abi Shayba has also mentioned this qawi and he's saying this is authentic Imam Ahmad in his Musnad also authenticated it once again this is now the same la tasubbu sahaba nabi alayhi salatu salam this is from Abdullah ibn Umar mawqufan from a sahabi he says that if one of you was to stand and pray amalan you pray and you do amal for your whole life you will not reach the daraja, the level of one hour or one moment of time that they had with Rasulullah sallallahu Meaning that the Sahaba, the fact that Allah chose them to sit with the Prophet even for a short period of time, this honor that is given for them, you cannot reach that level the lifetime of ibadah. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah, the great Sahabi, he mentions the same, except he mentions Arba'in Sana. He says, 40 years of your ibadah. And Arba'un is a number used, 40 is used by the Arab just to show a great amount. Why did I begin with this? Because today in our Ummah, there are those that want to divide the Ummah. Those that want to, want to use politics to separate us. And one of the ways they do this, like Yasir al khabif and if you don't know who he is, don't worry about it. And if you know who he is, then you know who he is. Who says, he, he, he claims, na'udhu billah, that Aisha radiyanha fil nar, that she is in the hellfire. Subhanallah, somebody that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran praised her. Somebody that you will find out what was her status with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Imagine somebody, today, if me and you, we have mothers, right? Whether they're alive or not, we have mothers. If your mother is a mu'mina, even though today we don't know who is a true person of iman. Like, we don't know. But if your mother was for sure given the glad tidings she's a believer, your own mother, just think of your own mother. My mother and your own mother, biological mother. 
And you see her as very pious, praying and fasting and giving sadaqah. And imagine that she even had a clear glad tiding that you were in Jannah from the Prophet ﷺ. Imagine. Your mother do not. But imagine. And then somebody comes and tells you, your mother's in the nar. I swear by Allah, your mother's in the nar. How angry would you get? Huh? More than that, you should have ghira for Aisha radiyan. Ummahat al mumini these are the mothers of the believers. These are our mothers. So we need to know about her from the authentic sources. So then we can explain to the ummah and we can unite the ummah. And we can explain to those who want to go and sit on a platform with those people that are cursing our mother and they think this is unity. When on the day of Mawlid, the bid'ah in itself, in San Diego, people go to those temples, the run masajid, and sit with those rawafila, and then they want to say this is unity. No, that's not unity. That is selling out the religion. That is selling out the Quran. That is selling out the Sunnah. That is selling out your Aqeedah. That is compromising your religion. That is apologizing. That is not having a backbone. It's a lot of things. It's not unity. What is unity? We go back to the Quran. We go back to the Sunnah. We go back to the Salaf al Ummah. That is unity. So, who is Aisha radiallahu anha? Let's get to know her. Our mother. The hadith that is muttafakun alayhi. Yani, it's reported in Al Bukhari and Muslim. And as I mentioned, many of these are reported through multiple chains, even. Authentic chains, no doubt to these chains. Amr ibn As radiallahu anhu mentions that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was asked. Now pay attention to this. Who was being asked? Huh? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Man, you guys so many, you guys are asleep, but. Who was being asked? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Mutlaqan, generally. He, Sahih Hadith, no doubt to the authentic. He is asked, Who is the most beloved person to you? No gender difference, no Ahlul Bayt or not, Sahabi or not, Arab or not, no, just generally, who is most beloved to you? The Qal sallallahu alayhi sallam, Aisha radiyana. Imagine that honor, imagine that love. Imagine that status, that you are the most beloved person to the Prophet ﷺ, mutlaqan. Why do we love Aisha radiyallahu anha? Because of the love of Rasulullah ﷺ. Why do we love Rasulullah ﷺ? Because of the love of Allah. Allah honored the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ by making him Rasulullah That's why we love him. And Rasulullah loved Aisha anha more than anybody else. So our love cannot be complete for Rasulullah without loving Aisha. Anha. When you love somebody truly, then you love who they love. You know, there is a, a poem. I don't really like to go into poems and things, but there is a message to it. And this is of course just a poem, it's not a hadith or something. Where they talk about uh, who they call Majnoon or Majnoon. Yeah? Some people, some ulema said his name is Thuban, whatever. And he was, he was touching the doors on the street where, I mean, Wallahu alam, again, this is a poem, it's not hadith, of where Layla lived. And he was kissing the doors, all the doors, just walking. People told him, you're crazy, what's wrong with you, right? Why are you kissing the doors? He says, not that I love the doors, it's I love that Layla went by these doors. Right? And this is uselessness, but it gives you a message. Now imagine if you love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and then you say, the one he loves the most. billah, you curse her. How can this be? It's nifaq, it's, it's impossible. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said that the most beloved person to him was Aisha radiyallahu 
فقلت so they said we asked من الرجال what about from men يعني everybody wanted their name to be there right what about from the men فقال أبوها صلى الله عليه وسلم said her father now imagine he didn't even say Abu Bakr رضي الله عنه you understand the love right like he he said Abuha he again put the damir towards her the ishara the point towards her you know today if you love somebody you will love their children you will love their parents you will love their you know why because of your love for them but you will say this is my friend's son this is my friend's mother right you you put that you may not mention them directly because your love is because of them right so here rasulullah sallam again honored her by saying abuha in the rest of the hadith just so you know فقلت ثم من he said what about after Abu Bakr فقال عمر بن الخطاب he said عمر بن الخطاب this is the hadith in al Bukhari and Muslim in other narrations Uthman ibn Affan is mentioned as well which is actually reported from Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyanhu but who were the best amongst the Sahaba and so on based on this hadith Ammar radiyallahu anhu as mentioned in the book Fadail al-Sahaba of Imam Ahmad in a Hassan, in an authentic rewaya, reliable rewaya, when he would mention a hadith from Aisha radiyanha, he would say, Qalat Habiba. He would say, Qalat Habiba. And sometimes he would say, Qalat Habiba bint Habib. Huh? Some people now want to put the word Habib to themselves. <laughs> Habib this and Habib Ali and Habib this. Then they attribute it to themselves. Some people, Al Habiba. But this is the Sahaba saying who was the Habiba of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that is why one of the names that Aisha Taradiyana is known by, and I'm going to mention seven of them, that are mentioned authentic ahadith. All from hadith, it's not our own making up. One of those seven that she was known by. And these are Al-Qab, Laqab, Al-Qab, these are titles. One of them was Habiba. And this is based on the hadith in Al-Bukhari and Muslim, as we mentioned. And this, the hadith in Fadal al-Sahaba shows the Sahaba, they knew her by this name. Habiba bint Habib. The beloved and the daughter of the beloved. Because Rasulullah Wasallam said, the most beloved of mankind to him is Aisha radiyanha, and from the men, Abuha. But what's her kunya? What's her nickname? In the Arab, and this is an Islamic tradition, they would have a, a nickname for a person. For example, Abu something, or Ibn Fulan, right? For example, Abu Bakr, huh? Abu Huraira, uh, Abu Hafs, and these are all Abu Darda. This is this is not their actual name. For example, Abu Hanifa. His name is not Abu Hanifa. <laughs> Many brothers all day, Hanafi, Hanafi, Hanafi. What's his name? Don't know. <laughs> Nu'man ibn Thabit, his actual name. Al Kufi. Al Kufi, Al Kufa. So, Abu Hanifa, the great faqih, his kunya is Abu Hanifa. If you look at Abu Huraira, that's his kunya. Aisha Taradiyanha, she didn't have one. When her nephew Abdullah ibn Zubair was born, and this is mentioned in the Sunan of Abi Dawud and Sheikh Al Bani Nistakhrij, graded to be a Sahih hadith. When she didn't have any children, and now Abdullah ibn Zubair was born to who? Zubair ibn Awam, the great Sahabi, one of the ten. But who's his mother? Huh? Asma bint Abi Bakr. So she is the sister of Aisha Taradiyanha. So now Aisha Taradiyanha at this time where her, her nephew was born. Her sister Asma bint Abi Bakr radiyallahu anha, the great Sahabiya, married to Zubair ibn Abba, the great Sahabi from the ten that were given the glad tidings of the Jannah. They had a very pious child who was well known. We studied about him Abdullah ibn Zubair in our Sira Durus as well. Huh? So when Abdullah ibn Zubair was born. Aisha, she went to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. 
She said, you know, everybody has a kunya. Like my sister will now be Um Abdullah. Some people say Um Abdullah. It's wrong because mudaf mudaf ilay Um Abdullah. You have to make majroor here. Huh? So she went to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and she said, you know, I don't have a kunya. So Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave her the kunya. He said, you are Um Abdullah. Um Abdullah. Why? Because of her nephew. So it also tells you the kunya is not always after your child. For example, Abu Huraira doesn't have a daughter named Huraira or a son named Huraira. Yeah? It's because we know he used to have a kitten. He used to keep with him in some of the narrations in his sleeve or at least with him. And because of that, they called him Abu Huraira. Hmm? Abu Bakr doesn't have a son named Bakr. Hmm? He has a son named Muhammad. He has other, but no, no son named Bakr. Bakr was a strong young camel. Known for strength. And Abu Bakr Radiyan had a very strong personality. So from before, they called him Abu Bakr. So here we see that Aisha Rani had a kunya, Um Abdullah. And this kunya was not given by anybody except the Rasul himself. He himself gave her this kunya. From the title she has is Umm al Mu'mineen. Umm al Mu'mineen, of course, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has talked about the azwaj of Nabi alayhi salatu salam being the, the ummahat of Mu'mineen. So the Quran gives her this kunya. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about them being the mothers of the believers, then she is Umm al Mu'mineen. As she is the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Now, if the Quran calls her our mother, imagine somebody who speaks ill about her. How can we tolerate? Huh? So she is Umm al-Mu'mineen. This is another one of her al-Qab, one of her titles. We already mentioned Habiba. Ne the next one is Muwaffaqa. Muwaffaqa, yani the one that has the fiqh or understanding. And this was given to her by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam as the hadith that is mentioned in the Musnad Imam Ahmad and the Sunan of, or the Jami'ah of Imam Tirmidhi, where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam talked about the ahkam of the one that has two daughters and raises them well upon the religion and upon a good tarbiyah until they're married and how that person will be with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam in Jannah. Now Aisha radiyanha, she loved to get the fiqh of the deen, the understanding. This is from the lack of our love for knowledge today that we hear a masala, we hear an issue, and we kind of, yeah, you know, we hear it, goes in one ear, out the other. We don't really try to understand it. But if you look at the Sahaba, عنهم, they weren't like this. They would ask the Rasul والسلام, until they understood it. Aisha, عنها, she asked Rasulullah وسلم, about what if somebody has one daughter? Because many people don't have two daughters. So Rasulullah then answers that even if somebody has one daughter, then Aisha said, what if somebody doesn't have daughters? <laughs> then Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi explained that I'm going to be going ahead of the Ummah, making shifa and so on. But here he called her with the title of the one that has the understanding or wants to understand. Why? Because she loved to get explanations about the ahadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then as we will study, she conveyed that to the Ummah. So that is three. The fourth this is from Humra, which means to be reddish. Huh? Hamira is Tazghir, is some Tazghir, like Umair from Umar, Hamira. This is one, but again, I like to always research, I like to know what's authentic. I don't want to just present something to you and then be reliable on the Day of Judgment, liable what I presented. Al-Dahabi and Ibn Al-Qayyim did not consider this to be authentically established. For example, Ibn Al-Qayyim in uh, Manar al-Munif in Sahih al-Da'if, uh, he says that this is not authentic. But I, I went to the books of Hadith and I found in the Sunan of Nisa'i, for example, in the Sunan al-Kubra, Hadith number 8951, and I found two other Sahih narrations where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did give her this name. So with all due respect to those ulama, when we have the evidence, we follow the evidence. So this is Hamira, Yani, the little red. 
Al-Dhahabi explains that this was used by the Arab for Bayda, for somebody who was light skinned. Because the Arab, when we think of white today, this would be Asfar for them, this would be yellow for them. That's why the Romans and European were called Banu Asfar. When we talk about white, black, you have to look at context of culture, right? So the Arab, where they were, when they saw Europeans, they considered them yellowish. So they called them Banu Asfar. So when they would say Bayda or white, they would take it to somebody who had a reddish complexion. So Humaira is a little red. And we know Aisha radiyanha was light skinned and she would turn red. So this is one of the names given to her by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam out of love for her. Then we have a Siddiqa, which is, يعني, when we talk about Sidq, يعني, that which is truthful. We know that Abu Bakr Radiyan, her father is known as a Siddiq, the truthful, right? But why do we take Siddiqa? Because of the hadith that is mentioned in the Mustadrak of Al-Hakim. And Al-Hakim, he narrates this saying upon the authority on Siddiqa. And Ibn Hajar Asqalani in Fath al-Bari, he also says that she is Siddiqa bin Siddiq. So they, from the hadith about Abu Bakr radiyanha, radiyallahu anhu, and from that sit that was taken from Aisha radiyanha, they gave this laqab that was used for her, a Siddiqa bin Siddiq, the truthful and daughter of the truthful. Then we have a Tayyiba, and this is, not something that we just give to her, but rather Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, the great Sahabi, the one that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua, that he has the understanding of the wahi, when Aisha radiallahu was at the time of her death, when, and when she was yani, ill towards the close end of her life. He, knowing that one, he was related to her, second, she is the mother of the believers, within the proper Islamic hijab, he requested to see her. And when he saw her, Abdullah ibn Abbas, he's very young. And you know he's related to the Prophet ﷺ, and she was the wife of the Prophet ﷺ. He went to her and he, he said to her, Kunti, you were Ahab al Nisa Rasulullah. You were the most beloved of the wives of Rasulullah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, At tayyibat uh, tayyibin, and in those are good or for the good. So Abdullah ibn Abbas, he takes the Quran and he makes tafsir of it and he says, because Allah chose you to be, to be married to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you are a tayyibah. You are the pure. And he gives the dalil from the Quran itself. And this is one of the titles that she had. She was also called the Mubarra, the one whose bara, whose Purity was established from the Quran itself. Al Masruq, the Tabi'i, he, when he talks about the Quran, he says Allah established the bara, the purity of Aisha radiyanha, and he says that is why she is Mubarra, that she is the one that is pure based on the Quran itself. So these are seven that I found in the Quran and Sahih Ahadith from the explanation of the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum from Aisha radiyanha. Now, when we talk about Aisha radiyanha, we want to talk about, before we get into her life, and we're gonna get into her life, I want you guys to know our mothers, and we're gonna talk about some of the other believe, mothers of the believers, Umm Salama and others as well. But we wanna talk about the value, the service that she brought to this Umm. And this is very important because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for him. And each one had a benefit for the ummah. We talked about Khatija radiyanha in the earlier durus and what benefit she did for the ummah and for the da'wah and so on. So we want to talk about Aisha radiyanha and why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose her and honored her and benefited this ummah. This was not a marriage of lust. This was a marriage of love for the sake of Allah. Understand the difference. 
Today, people say, I love this person. You know, they, they see a, an actor or a sports star, and they're like, I love this guy. You don't even know him. <laughs> if you had to live with him, maybe you'd hate him. You know? But this is not love. Maybe infatuation, maybe lust, maybe something else. Yeah? But the true love is for the sake of Allah. Abu Musa al-Ashari, and this hadith is mentioned in the Jamia of Imam al-Tirmidhi, and it's a sahih, it's an authentic narration. He says, ma ashkala alayna. Now, now, who's saying this? Who's saying this? Abu Musa. Who is Abu Musa al-Ashari? It's a sahabi. So a sahabi is saying that when something would be difficult for us, ma ashkala alayna, upon us, ashab Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's saying when something was difficult, hadithan, qat, any time, where a hadith, where something from the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, that we didn't understand, what did the sahaba do? Not even the tabi'oon. The sahaba who saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who heard those hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they said when something was difficult, for us to understand in the hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so we used to ask Aisha She was an, she was an alima even to the Sahaba. Imagine. And this is something that our ummah today needs to take inspiration from. Today, when we talk about education, we have two extremes in the ummah. One, that want to deny Muslim women education, and that's not Islamic. In Islam, no doubt that the women of Islam have done a great service for the ummah in the different sciences. And the greatest example of that is Aisha And not just in, uh, and we'll talk about in which sciences. But no doubt if she didn't have that great knowledge, we would have lost as an ummah. The other extreme is when they talk about education, they only talk about leaving Islam. <laughs> leaving the hijab, leaving salah, leaving yani, the ahkam of sharia, bringing ikhtilat, bringing kufr, bringing... This is education. When you talk about Quran or hadith or even yani, studying secular sciences within the boundaries, that that's not education to them. Education to them is if you leave the hijab and you shave your beard and you start uh, making monkeys your ancestors, that's education. No, we have to have the balance. Yes, we need education, science, math, technology, Quran, hadith, we need all of that. But within the bounds of qala Allah wa qala Rasul, alayhi salatu Aisha had such amounts of knowledge that the Sahaba, the men from the Sahaba would go. Now, today many of our sisters, they want to be involved in the da'wah, but at the expense of violating their hijab. No, we draw the line. I don't care if you like me, you don't like me, cancel me, go ahead. <laughs> huh? No. Now Aisha radiyanha, even in hajj, even in Ihram, in Ihram. She said, when the non-Mihram men came close, we took our khimar and covered our faces. In Ihram, today, some brothers, no brother, woman cannot cover the face in Ihram. Where did you get this? Wearing a niqab, a separate piece of cloth, is a different issue. Wasatr al wajh is a different issue. You think you know better than Aisha radiyanha? In Ihram, with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa when the non-Mihram came close, they would cover it. At that time, there used to be a way. You know, they used to make tawaf on camels with their families only. So yes, a separate piece of cloth called the niqab was worn by the rich at that time. Understand the ilan and hikmah. Don't just go and talk without knowledge. For example, men cannot wear like a nice stitched thobe like this. We wear the izar and rida. Which, by the way, Rasulullah used to wear regularly too, not just for haram. And it doesn't have to be white, even the white is the best. Why? Because everybody can afford it, and we all look the same. But if amain, the turbans, were not afforded by everybody at that time. Today, cloth is very common. But you're talking about a time, when as we know from the Hitan al-Bukhari, 
where the, one of the Sahaba, when he used to leave the Salah, he didn't have enough to cover himself. And he didn't have that. He, he said, they gave me a kameez, like a thaw. It was the most happy day of my life, you know. Like just having one thaw was such a big deal for them. Today, because of, you know, cough becoming common, we don't understand. But you need to understand these ahkam. So only the rich woman could afford to have a, a separate piece of cloth called the niqab. But that doesn't mean you don't cover your face or your aura and, and have the haya. So Aisha radiyanha, she says, even in ihram, when the non-mahram came close, we took our cloth with one head called the khimar, we covered our faces. Look at her haya. She had that knowledge, but she didn't violate her haya. Today, sister saying da'wa is I'm going to do makeup tutorials on TikTok. It's not da'wa. I don't know. Maybe it's da'wa, but not towards Islam. So, Abu Musa al-Ashari says that we would ask Salna Aisha radiallahu anha illa wajadna indaha minha ilma yani every time we asked her about hadith we found that she had the answer we did not ask her the question any question that was difficult for us about the sunnah except that she had the answer this was as the ulama of Islam it's not my ishtihad have said was one of the reasons why Allah chose her at her age and at her time to be from the Ummahat al Mu'mineen to preserve that knowledge for us. People in the West don't think about this. But Allah doesn't need acceptance from the West. Allah's hikmah is above that. <coughs> Masruq, the Tabi'i, the famous scholar from the Tabi'un, he said, لَقَدْ رَأَيْتُ الْأَكَابِرْ Verily, I saw the major من sahaba the major sahaba, not just the regular, but the elders, the top, the akabir of the sahaba, sahaba to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sahaba of Muhammad alayhi wa sallam, yas'alunaha, asking Aisha radiallahu anha an al-fara'id, which is the inheritance. So, now, not just the hadith, not just okay, she lived with Rasulullah and she memorized his personal life. That is an aspect. But even her fiqh, even her knowledge of understanding the implementation in the inheritance, which is a very difficult subject, by the way. She was the one that had that knowledge, and that's why the Sahaba in Sunan al Darami is mentioned, Bisnadu Sahih, Al Hakim has graded this to be an authentic narration as well. Hisham ibn uh, Urwa ibn Zubayr. Now, who's a Zubayr? Husband of yeah. And then Urwa is his son, but he's a younger son. And Hisham is his son. So he reports from his father, Urwa ibn Zubayr, who's Ani, he is the son of Zubayr ibn Awam, but he's younger. He says, Ma raitu ahadan. I did not see anybody a'lam bi kitab Allah wa bi wala bi sunnat Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam wa ba wala bi shi'r wala bi fara'id min al-Aisha radiyallahu anha subhanallah notice something he did not say min an-nisa he said Urwa ibn Zubayr as his son has reported from him I did not see anyone he did not separate between men and women. He says, I did not see anyone more knowledgeable about the kitab of Allah, about the Quran, or about the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa or about poetry, or about the inheritance than Aisha Taradiyan. You see, her knowledge was multifaceted. She had knowledge about many of these things. Al-Zuhri, Ibn Shihab Al-Zuhri, many if you know who he is, then he's from the great scholar of the Tabi'un. And if you don't know who he is, you should. He said, Law jumi'a ilm al-Aisha radiyanha ila ilm al-jami'a ilm al-nisa. If you take the knowledge of Aisha radiyanha with the knowledge of all of the women, all of the women, ilmuha afdhal. Her knowledge would be more. 
This is how يعني, knowledgeable she was. Abdullah ibn Zubayr. And this is the other son of Zubayr ibn Awam. Abdullah ibn Zubayr, the one that we talked about his birth. Right? He says that I went to Aisha radiyanha. Look at this, because it's, it's his aunt. She's mahram to her. He says, I went to her and I said, I see you the most knowledgeable in the Quran. I see you the most knowledgeable in the Sunnah and the Ansar, the Nasab, the lineage. And I see you the most knowledgeable in Tib, in medicine. Now, this is very interesting. Her knowledge was very strong in medicine. So he said, I can understand why you know so much about the Quran. Because you were there when it was revealed. Yani Aisha radiyanha, many times Rasulullah would be with his head on her lap when the wahi was revealed. So she was there, so she understood the context. So of course, that's why she knew the tafsir. And that's why today, if you pick up any tafsir based on Athar, Tabari, Ibn Kathir, or so on, you will never find one except that it has narration from Aisha radiyanha. And he says, I understand why you know the most about the sunnah because you were the closest wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that was always with him. And that is true. She is from the top narrators of hadith. And if you pick up any book like Bukhari or Tirmidhi or Ibn Majah or Abu Dawud or Musnad or Muatta, you will always find a hadith from Aisha radiyallahu She says, that's understandable. And the Ansab, the Nasab, the lineage, because your father Abu Bakr, Radiallahu anhu was an expert in the lineage. And this is a science that is becoming lost today. But this is something that was important to know your lineage. To know your qaba'il, to know your father. Today, most people ask him, who's your dad? I don't know. <laughs> could be the postman. It could be <laughs> This is the West we live in. Huh? But the Arab, they used to know their lineage well. And they would use it for da'wah. Not for flexing on each other. They wouldn't be like, oh, I'm this. No. Abu Bakr radiyan, he was an expert. So when he would take Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to the Arab to give da'wah, he would tell them, where are you from? Banu Tamim. Okay, you know Banu Tamim comes from this, from this. And he would connect the lineage with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam going up. And then he would say, this is your brother. And in lineage, listen to him. They would use it for da'wah. And so he said, the fact that you are an expert, it's understandable because your father was an Yudun. But how did you become an expert in medicine? We did so she said that I used to care for Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, And when he would become sick or an ailment would come, whether it was from the people that visited him and told him about what can benefit certain ailments or it was something from him, he would tell me to go and bring the ingredients and put it together and give it to him. And from that, I learned medicine. So she was at her time an expert in medicine as well. If we talk about the virtues of Aisha radiyanha, no doubt we can be here yani, for days and days and not finish them. But I will mention one hadith. And this hadith, many times we hear it, but we don't understand it. And this hadith is from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa himself. And it is a sahih hadith. Where he mentioned about, and there are many versions that are longer, about the women that reach perfection. Women who reach perfection. And the end of it he mentioned, inna fadl al-Aisha radiallahu anha, al-Nisa. The virtue of Aisha upon other women, kal fadl al-Tharid, ala sa'ir al-Ta'am. Tharid was a food the Arab had with, with meat and bread mixed. Now people today, they don't understand. Some people even mock this. Like, what does that mean? But this is because of the lack of their knowledge. Rasulullah sallallahu was speaking to a people who understood the context. But for us, if we don't understand, we need to go to the people of knowledge. Ibn al-Qayyim, he explains this. He said the Arab had different types of food. 
And some of them used to be just bread. And the Arab were not fancy people. So it would just be bread. They would bake bread and they would eat it and that would be their food. And sometimes they would just hunt, they would get meat and they would cook it and they would just eat meat. All you keto guys. Right? Like Ismail alayhi salam, that used to be their diet, meat and water. So the Arab had these types of food. Sometimes it would just be dates. They didn't have, the Arab at that time, didn't have rice and things as local to them. Because it was a rough environment. So this was there. But the most comprehensive of the foods that the Arab had was tarib. Because it would include the bread and meat together. So he mentions there that this was a saying amongst the Arab. So the Arab understood that if they saw something to be the best, they would give that example. An Nabawi, Imam An Nabawi, he explains this as well. He says, because in the Arab, it was the most nutritious, it was the most filling, the most yani, uh, comforting of the food that they had to digest, and they enjoyed eating it the most. And it was the top of what they had. So the Arab in their poems, when they would give that example, when they said something was the best, they would give that example. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam gave that example for Aisha radiyana over all other women. To show her virtue. She was born in Mecca. The exact date of her birth is not recorded as in like today how we say this scholar was born in this hijri. Rather as the ulema of the time they would do is they would look at important historical incidences and they would calculate backwards. So many of the ulema, they gave the date to be four years after Nabuwa and other opinions have been given about her date of her birth in Mecca. Regarding her life early on, we know that she was from the beloved children of Abu Bakr Radian. Abu Bakr Radian loved her a lot. And from a very early age, she was known for her intelligence. And one of the mushrikeen at that time, and this is in the early times of Mecca, and he is the son of Mut'im ibn Adi. The Mut'im ibn Adi was a well-known mushrik, and he was respected even though he was not Muslim. And his, name was, his son's name was Jubair ibn Mut'im ibn Adi. He had requested Aisha radiyanha for marriage, at that time in the early times of Mecca, and the marriage had not taken place, but she had been given in yani, a proposal to him in Mecca. And inshallah, in the next dars, we'll pick up from there uh, the marriage of Aisha radiyanha to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the wisdoms behind it, the age, and all the masail related to it, and inshallah, about the beginning of her service for the deen. Uh, next Saturday, inshallah, after Maghrib, uh, we'll give the adhan 